uh, we have the pleasure of having what is uh, considered as the father of digital storytelling. And we, he was so nice to come all, all, all the way from the United States and uh, from California to uh, Italy, where he found almost the same weather, except for the rain yesterday. Uh, so let me introduce uh, Joe Lambert. Well, first I want to uh, thank the university here for inviting me over and, and say how much a pleasure it's been to be with a group of colleagues from around Europe this week. To become aware, in a sense, of the way these European projects work. Uh, our work in Europe goes back to 1996, and um, while we've had the pleasure of going many countries in Europe, this will be the first project where we've had a kind of more direct role in relationship to a, a, a multilateral implementation. And and it obviously calls to us that global citizenship is, you know, in its essence, um, what our work has always been about. And so I want to present our work in that context with any luck at all. This will work. You know, the starting point of our work really starts with the issue of the way we're consuming um, screen. Uh, most parents since the 1950s have complained that their kids are lost in the television set. And the screens have dominated our lives, obviously, for half a century. But in this part of the 21st century, it's pretty clear that young people, and really all people, are in front of screens all the time. And while we value the other modes of communication that we've had, from conversation to writing to uh, the exchange of image as a tangible physical object, um, the idea in our work is that we need the screen as a process to bring us back into things like effective writing and effective visual communication to essentially teach us things we knew since I'm sure the cave parents said, you're spending too much time staring at the fire, go out and write something on the wall or do something creative. And in our minds, this idea of... Uh, living in a world that, that educators and, and parents and um, really everyone that's trying to move society forward is competing with the you know infinite number of channels of information suggests that the main thing we need to do is a, a process that we call uh, restorification. In our minds, the 100 years of broadcast media has done to our stories in the same way, essentially, uh, economic development has done to our forests, to our landscapes. And just as we need now to restore and reclaim our natural environments, we need to restore and claim our stories. So this process is linked in many ways to other uh, processes in our lives. Uh, coming to Italy, I lived in Italy from in 2003 and 4. Um, Learning how to take a three and a half hour meal was a really significant thing in my life. I grew up in Texas where fast food was just how we did it. There was a lot of uh, uh, drive-by eating. And this idea that you would sit and enjoy a meal over many hours and the conversations that came was very important to me. And, and just as the uh, slow food movement, which has its base here in Italy, has become an international movement for the reclamation of eating local and eating well and enjoying the cultural process of food. In a sense, digital storytelling is a similar idea of reclaiming our voices through media to understand our stories. I'll tell you a little bit about the background of CDS. I'm not going to spend too much time here. Um, I come out of community arts, which in the United States was an outgrowth of the movements of the 1960s and civil rights and feminism and gay and lesbian rights and the ability to, to sort of uh, use art to 
to engage people in social change. That work led me to run a theater, and amongst the projects I had was a project with a man named Dana Ashley. So this is why I jokingly said to Federico, I'm not the father of digital storytelling, but because that honor I think belongs to the late Dana Ashley, who in 1990, uh, created the show Next Exit, which I was a creative advisor and director of. And the show was about a man who sat in front of a little fire and told stories of his life in little bits, using them in an interactive way that was just like a singer-songwriter might have his songs on the top of his guitar. And he might sing this song that night, but he could do the same with these projected stories. He was a video producer and a, a highly trained graphic artist, and his voice through this story inspired many people to say, how could we do this ourselves? So we began a conversation, uh, Dana and I, and this is my wife, uh, Nina Mullen, in the early 90s with new media producers. Uh, the event we used to have was called Joe's Digital Diner. And we linked ourselves with the, new media, the explosive new media uh, community of the Bay Area in the early 1990s which led uh, to Dana's show becoming promoted, us opening up a center called the San Francisco Digital Media Center, and then finally uh, beginning a series of festivals that continue today in, in the form of international conferences about digital storytelling, bringing people from all over the world to discuss these new ideas. When we think about digital storytelling, it's really presented across a spectrum of participatory media. Uh, in our minds, watching television and watching uh, the screen is participatory in as much as you're reacting to it, talking to it. At least in my house, uh, we talk back at our televisions. Uh, surfing the web is certainly interactive in the, in the choices. But obviously, when we move across the spectrum, digital storytelling moves to the level of co-collaboration where the point of our work is not to tell people how they should tell their stories, but to create an environment, a highly facilitated environment, where people come to their stories in a deep and profound way. And it's the step, if you will, just before doing it yourself. We do that through a process that's a four-part where we focus on giving people the ideas of what a story is or could be in this multimedia form, not a prescription, but a series of aesthetic ideas. We discuss those ideas and, and people's thoughts about their scripts in what we call the story circle, which is a very intimate and can be profound uh, discussion, uh, trying to find why the story is being told now. We also have people go through a production process that leads to celebration that in each and every circumstance is very much about people feeling like they're together in leading this process, that it's not one person by themselves, but it's a group of people that are going to all bring all the stories home. And as a result, these processes um, have created really a movement of transformative practice for uh, educators, but also for community organizers and social workers who come to see the ability of this workshop process to not only get great stories, but to change people's lives. Now, I was asked to come up with a story, and I have a feeling on a PC this may not play. We'll see. Do the quick time thing. So what I'll do is drop out for a second. He said with such confidence. Drop out for a second. Use the magic of media. And so I'm supposed to know how to use a computer. We'll see if this works. This is going to claim it's going to open not this one. You know, I was trying to think of a story... Is that open, in effect? Or that huh, open with, uh, what do we think, VLC? VLC should work. Yeah, let's, here we go. All right, let's start over. Uh -oh. I was struck by the statement the first time yeah, I read it you over 10 years. Statement. Let me just give the background. Um, we offer workshops in Berkeley um, on a monthly basis, and I happen to be the teacher of the one in September. And one of the students came was from a Polynesian community. I grew up, in, as you'll see, in a very small island in the middle of the Pacific. 
but he's an international educator now. He, he, for Santa Clara University, which is the Catholic University in San Jose, he runs their international um, student uh, program. And I felt the theme that he brings up right at the beginning here, which is a quote about, if your liberation is connected to my liberation, then let's work together. And I think that in the spirit of global citizenship, this is exactly what we're going to be trying to talk about. So let's see if this will work. I was struck by this statement the first time I read it over 10 years ago while attending graduate school in California. Back then, it reminded me of my roots in the Pacific Island nation of Micronesia, a country that has been victimized by colonialism ever since Portuguese explorers arrived uninvited in 1525. Today, the quote has brought a new meaning to me as an international educator at Santa Clara University. It has become a source of invitation to my students to build a better world through peaceful engagement. I am inspired by these American students who challenge themselves to go far and beyond their familiar horizons. In some ways, their desires to study in other countries connect with my own horizon. Growing up on a speck of sand in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, I used to gaze out at the endless horizon that surrounded the island and wondered what was out there. Even without the modern comforts of electricity, running water, and ESPN, life for the 400 people on my island was simple and beautiful. When I left the shores of my island in search of an American education, I was fearful of leaving the familiar ways for the modern world. But in my search for liberation, I have come to appreciate the world more, found love, and become an ambassador to a world that once ruled my ancestors. At times, I just want to tell my students to challenge themselves by choosing to study in less known, less developed countries. For it is in our vulnerabilities that we discover our strengths, in learning from those different from ourselves that we appreciate our own roots, in the search for our own liberation that we can feel the needs of others. And in those moments of connections, we build a better and peaceful world. So with respect, I'll leave that story with you as a great example to inspire maybe some of the other teachers who will come through the process and think about their relationship as educators to the, to the process of global citizenship what degree are they helping young people uh, find their own way through that process? Who do we need? Going back to PowerPoint. The work of CDS, and I'll finish up briefly here. The work of CDS has taken us all over the world. Um, it's in 42 countries and, and, you know, virtually every part of the United States has been touched by our work in some way. Um, what we've learned is that there are lots of ways to apply digital storytelling. And I won't enumerate all of them, but you get the idea that it's not just an educational tool, but it's a tool that's been used across education and society and in countless different ways to help people understand um, uh, this way of communicating through personal, authentic voice and media as a as a tool of connection and, and in, this, in essence, solidarity. Uh, in education, people have found this tool is a perfect um, sweet spot for the different um, interests that uh, contemporary educators are trying to uh, face. And so many educational environments have picked up digital storytelling. And we hope through this project that there will be a new generation of uh, teachers who find this uh, as a useful tool and it will disseminate deeply into the countries that are collaborating in this project. Um, a number of the nonprofits, particularly our colleagues from Bulgaria, have been doing work in the context of violence prevention, particularly in family violence, 
um, against women and children. And this work of ours for the last decade has captured uh, hundreds of stories in all parts of the world, uh, looking at the way that these stories not only can um, bear witness to the tragedies that happen in our communities around human rights, but also can act to save other lives. They can become educational advocacy tools to change policies that don't allow us to confront these issues. And I think one of the aspects of this process of focusing on global citizenship is that it's not purely educational. It's about changing minds in ways that hopefully create a more safe and uh, and digni you know, dignified relationship between uh, different communities that have been at conflict or continue to be in conflict within each of our societies. Uh, in that way, it can relate to uh, processes like uh, Men as Partners in South Africa. These five stories were shown before Parliament in South Africa shortly after they were made to get uh, the mostly male leadership of the South African Parliament to look at the role of men in relationship to power and violence uh, and the spread of HIV AIDS. And it was a significant moment that the, each of these stories were essentially, you know, became part of the central discussion in that country about changing policy. Um, we work with organizations, large and small, around uh, health care issues. And uh, this is one of the organizations working with dementia and Alzheimer's uh, through a museum uh, in Australia, or another example in the UK, a wonderful project that has worked with um, uh, nurses and healthcare providers in using patient stories to change policies. And again, there are countless other examples, our work with the BBC, the work with the Swedish uh, National Radio, and uh, projects like this early uh, European-wide project, which we didn't um, directly collaborate with, but demonstrated the power of digital storytelling in a multinational youth uh, process. Uh, I'm going to leave it there. Um, I didn't know whether I had a couple of minutes, if anybody had any questions, but I always like to uh, leave a minute or two if there's a question from the, from the floor before I step back. So thank you.